Phil Kachima, when did you come to Harlow and why? Came to Harlow, I think, uh, in the early 70s, if not late 60s. My father got a job here at Costa Electronics, which is, I think, well, I think they had two sites at the time, didn't they? Pinnacles and Temple Fields. And he got a job there, and then he moved from there to here. He got a house, and once he got the house, then moved the family across over near Bush Fair. So where, where did your father move from? From Kent, Chatham. Uh, I don't know what he did there, obviously, but I certainly remember him coming here and then l later on learning it was electronics. And, and how old were you? Um, let's have a look. I must have been 10, 9, 10, somewhere around that age. So, so were you happy to make this move? Well, there's no choice at the time. <laughs> <laughs> we're moving. I remember we were waiting for the van at uh, Chatham. And, you know, when you're waiting for something and you're waiting and, 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 and nothing happens and and then you're dying to go to the loo and well, as soon as I go to the loo it's going to turn up. I can vaguely remember going off to the loo and then it turns up and everything was put into the van and then we appeared down at this end of town and we've been here ever since really. So what are your uh, earliest memories of, of living in Harlow? Swimming pool, going down there on a Sunday afternoon, standing in the long queues trying to get in, putting the little wristbands on waiting hours and then getting an hour in there and they'd shout out the wristband colour and then you'd have to get out and then we'd go down to the town park. I can't remember if the little swimming pools were there at the time but certainly later on in, in, in my youth they, they were there. And we used to wander around there, perhaps go over the bridge of the railway line and take a wander along the, uh, the River Stort. And what about your father? Your father what did he do at Cossers? He was an engineer, tester I believe. So the equipment that they made, which was mainly military stuff, radar, um, else? they must have done something else, radar, they did telemetry and stuff at the time I think, but that was then petered out to other companies. And did you, and you as, a, as growing up, I mean, did you develop a sense of interest in, in IT and electronics? And I did, I took on electronics as a hobby. Um, Dad got me a soldering iron and he used to get little bits from work, little transistors and things, and I used to make little kits and he bought me a, a radionics kit one Christmas which was a, a board, which is like a circuit board with holes in and then you had these, the resist the components and you used to put them in, screw them up and a book with different layouts to produce different things like flashing lights and little buzzers, <laughs> it's an email, <laughs> and then um, from then I used to that used the, the ones that he bought me, make little things and go put them into little tic tac boxes and stuff and, and uh, just fiddle around with electronics really. And did you did you have any outlet at school at all to do be able to do stuff like that? Nothing at the time. No. Nearest was physics, you know, and which was not really, you know, it was more at the bottom end of it, which is the how it all worked, whether as opposed to putting things together and making components talk to each other and. and, and and, and doing things, so things like walkie talkies, you know, things which were legal at the time. But I had managed to make transmitters and send them over to me FM radio, uh, you know, light sensitive devices so that it would come on when the lights went dark. And, or sending audio transmissions via, via light, you know, the bulb that used to flicker and a little sensor that used to pick it up. So, leading on, what, where was your first job? First job was a newspaper round which uh, on a Saturday I think it was in the evening used to go around, deliver all around the area so and then uh, looking forward to collecting your 50p or a pound or whatever it was in them days uh, and that's um, no actually I tell you like before then it went potato picking <laughs> with the use of a vehicle used to come round and you used to be able to get on it if you wanted to go on it. Uh, but I spent the whole day no, pea picking all day filling up a sack and I thought, no, no, it's, it's got to be something better than this. Was it far, far from Harlow, just now? I can't remember where it was. Oh. I remember just, get, I remember vaguely going on and being a long day. And uh, we used to actually have, what, we used to have this coach come round. I don't remember anyone else remembers on a Sunday, delivering, uh, not delivering, but you could go in it and buy stuff. Because on Sunday in them days, the shops were all shut. Mm. But this coach used to come round. He used to stop. You could go in there and get some bread or sweets. Uh, it used to be a long time ago, I forgot about him. And what about your first job after, your first full time job? 
first full time job. I think it was Cossus. Right, so you. Not, yeah, not, not the family firm, Cossus. but you Yeah, I went in there as, as a trainee wireman. Right. Uh, from Cossus. Any idea what year this might be? It had been about 75, 76. Hmm. And then from there, used to wire stuff, what's known as Harlow 8, which is gone now, which is by the shops. Mm -hmm which is also where the industrial health service used to be. So I think now it's an Indian restaurant. Mm -hmm. uh, and we used to be in, in that area. And I was in there for years doing doing wiring. And then a vacancy appeared in the installation department. And I went over there and that's where you travelled and installed the equipment. So it was still the same but doing it out. So I managed to get to see quite a bit of the world without having to pay for it. Uh, and um, travel and save some money because obviously I wasn't at home to do that. Uh, and that was um, that was exciting. Where did you see? Where did you well, go? I went to uh, to Cyprus, Akrotiri, to like, Holland, Belgium, Dubai, um, and some far-flung places in the UK. Um, Tyree, mm -hmm. uh, right at the top of uh, Scotland on the left. Tyree is further down. Oh, I am not remember the name of it now. Wherever there was radar sites. Like Macrohanish and Cape Wrath and yeah. They're right up the top yeah. Shetland. Shetland, right. Shetland's okay. up the top there. And they've got a, a radar site there, so we went in mm. there to do it and Tyree had a little radar site. In fact Tyree was just a just a line with one road going round with a road coming off for the ferry and a little one for the for the plane. Mm. And we spent months on there doing work. Ireland was another place we went to quite a lot, used to get the ferry across from uh, Roslyn, I think, to Cork at the time. And that was about the time the shuttle arrived, the uh, NASA shuttle, that uh, I was doing that sort of work. A lot of people, you know, we're into our tenth month of these Harlow 70 interviews, and a lot of people um, lay great stress on their work, you know, from Pitney Bowes, Key Glass, um, Shenville Press, Dorstall Press, BP, and Cossas is mentioned quite a lot. Did you did you enjoy your work? Did you was it just a job, or did you actually enjoy and sense a community? No, no, it was a. You, um, when you work with people full time, obviously you, you build relationships with them, and you have to to work with people even if you don't always like them. And we should take the mick out of each other all the time. You know that's how it, it works really. Uh, and we, um, you know. The, People go to the loo, some will take ages to go for some reason. And we had it with a newspaper or something, you know, old Fred's in trap too, you know, don't go in there. And, I'd, and in fact, when I joined, um, I, was, I, I did the usual training, I did the, the tea making for everyone. And I think I spent two or three years doing that until I complained to the foreman, you know, I was fed up with making tea for everyone. And it was, there was a guy that used to hang his tea bag up afterwards, you know, let it dry so he could reuse it. You know, and that sort of stuff, you know, would, would prompt good conversation and, mm. uh, and uh, rib tickling. But I enjoyed it there. Yeah, I got to know a lot of people there, made a lot of friends, did a lot of socialising with them and uh, used to go out in the evenings. And of course, in fact, had a social club there, over at, uh, well, it's all gone now, isn't it, over that area? Mm. There was an another social club over there as well. I can't think what that one was. That Kidney Bows or? That was Johnson Matthew. Johnson Matthew. Mm. He used to drive up the road and yeah. then there was a the first one, you went mm. past that one and Cossas was on the end. Yeah. Here you are looking at, you know, a camera looking at you, but you've often developed an interest in being behind the camera and filming. Where, where did that come from? Oh, really? <laughs> Photography is where I started. Started, right. Back in the 80s, I guess. 79, somewhere around there, that particular, which I think is still up there actually, a uh, film camera and used to use that, so anywhere I went to take photographs. Unlike today, I used to take good photographs because you only had 20 or 25 shots and so you had to make them count and then you may not see them for months and then you get the memories back. You know, all that would be rubbish or dark because you'd cocked up the, uh, the aperture. They weren't automatic, obviously. And then from there it moved to, to video. Maybe in... Um, 88, somewhere around there when VHS came out. And then from there to obviously to, to where I am now. Going back to photography for a second, what do you, in your opinion, what is the value of a good photograph above all else? It's one that's pleasant to look at. 
and invokes memories. Uh, and I realise a lot of kids now, they do selfies. And I just avoid selfies. Because when you want to look at a photograph, you know who the person is. You've met the person, you know them. You don't really want to see them with what you want to know is what on earth is behind you. Where, where are you? And all you see is a big face and a little bit of scenery. And you don't really get, I would say, is a good looking photo. You get a picture of someone. But really a good looking will have a nice bit of composition. It'll show a bit of depth. So you put something close, something in the distance, so you can see how big something is. Because you'll get... Uh, I used to have some photos back on my camera that someone had taken and there'd be a plane flying over it and they'd have taken a picture of it because it, it looked bigger in their mind but mm. when you got it back it was this little spot on the on the, on the uh, photos which were from True Print by the way <laughs> because you got those extra two prints yeah. <laughs> remember you used to cut them and you used to get the two like um, photo, uh, little ones uh, like the passport type photos mm. so it's really getting that composition and it's one of those things you really you have to. You just have to watch and learn. Uh, and I always self-taught. And I used to develop my own. I used to do black and white as well. And your film. You must have. Do you have quite an archive of film? You know, around Harlow from from the eighties. Loads. Yeah. Loads. Photos as well, probably in the loft. But to get them all out and scan them would just take too much. I did offer um, the Harlow Museum if they wanted to to give a hand and digging through the tapes and uh, going through and, and grabbing the information. Some of it's on the website that I, on my own that when I found some I put some up there. But a lot of the stuff started mainly about 88, 90 which is the video stuff and that was through hospital radio so I did that for many years. did that for a little period of time, stopped because I then worked away so I couldn't do the commitment and then uh, a good friend of mine Tony Saxby they invited me back again and I went back in and as the engineer we used to fix and repair stuff and design stuff and um, we used to do the outside broadcasts and I used to film a lot of those events so I used to wander around with it and there weren't small cameras then days, there were mm. kind of big shoulder things so it's not so inconspicuous so, and then we used to wander around and I got the other stuff for the town show some of the little shows, I don't know if anyone's mentioned the little mini shows that we used to have at Staple, not Staple Tire, um, the Stowe the field round the back there where the mm -hmm. car park is, the new car park, mm -hmm. that field that there and some of the other areas. And why do you think, in your opinion, I mean here we are filming you in 2017 as part of an important archive of people in Harlow, you know, why do you think, remem you know, taping, recording history, why do you think that recording history is important, especially for a town like Harlow? It just reminds you of what things were like in the past when you look at black and white photos now of the last century. You, you look at it and your imagination thinks, I wonder what it was like. And you can see photos of Harlow where there's practically no houses and horses and stuff, you know. And you think, well, you know, how did they survive? How did they manage? How did they live? What sort of work did they do? What sort of conditions did they live? And it just makes you appreciate what you've got now. You know, you can go in there, turn the water on, turn the heating on you know, shut the door and keep it nice and warm, whereas in them days it probably... I guess my next question would be, where did you develop your, this sounds too much of a technical question, but where did you develop your sense of community? Because you are seen as a, you know, a, a major figure in the Harlow, Harlow community. Hmm. So just the, just the desire to, to help others really. You know, I haven't had a, a rich life or anything, but I've had a, a, a nice life. And sometimes people haven't got that, and it's just nice to be able to help people to uh, have a nice life without having to, to go through the drudgery of it all. So I guess make specific reference to Bearcroft. They have the Bearcroft is it Residence Association, is that right? That's right. Yeah. Well, how, how did that come about, and how did your involvement come about? Well, I've lived here since the early 80s. So been here quite a long time. Uh, the estate had slowly sort of gone downhill really uh, from an aesthetic point of view. The houses were, were getting on. I think they were built in about 70, early 70s, somewhere around that time. And then from what I can gather from some of the people who've lived here that long, that in order to, to get one of these properties you had to earn a certain amount of money uh, to get in there. So it's um, in a, I think about 97, maybe 98, the council decided that 
you know, and, and, and the resident decided that something needs to be done. At the time, I believe Fernhill and the Casbah and places like that were also being refurbished. But they looked into Bearcroft and they'd run out of fund, either run out of funding or they couldn't afford it. Mainly because there was white asbestos on the properties and that they feared that was going to cost quite a bit of money. And there was a new initiative out from the government at the time for the new type of housing association, which was a, a lot leaner and cleaner than it is now. Actually, it's gone big and fat again. And it was more rea reactive to, to the locals and it was quite quick and fast. And then we had loads of meetings, etc., on how and the best way to go forward. And that was the way that was eventually taken. Uh, most of the information is on the website, so you can find that and, and what happened about about the um, the vote, etc. Uh, while that was going on, the resident association was set up by myself, Pat Alderton, and Penny, who has now passed away. Um, between us, well, actually more the girls than me, I was sort of pushed, <laughs> than jumping in. And um, between them, the, we. Um, managed to, to get the Red Association together, become coherent and then put in um, requests, demands for people who couldn't make and attend meetings, which is how we managed to get hold of 65 Bearcroft as part of the deal in, in doing that. And then from then on we've just done and run events. Then Pat died maybe, passed away six years ago maybe and then Pat I think moved on five years ago. So I've been there since, Jackie helps me now and there's a few others, Frank who does the, the warden. Uh, and we just keep, we're, we're just below, you know, we're just in the background there but we still run, like we've got the Halloween coming up, which we've run for a good few years now. And we've got the football at the back there that we've been running with the hard standing that we've done. We've got lights up there for the kids in the evenings so they can carry on playing. So, sorry to ask, it sounds like a technical question, but what is the purpose, what do you think is the purpose of the Residents Association? I think the purpose, the regional purpose, is to bring everyone together and make sure that, um, like a union, I guess, to make sure that uh, you know when we was having this conversion done, that we weren't going to be have the rug or something pulled out underneath us. But it's really to try and bring the communities together, which is really becoming harder and harder. People sort of staying in their houses much more, becoming weary of people outside, even if they're your neighbours. You know, sometimes you have neighbours you don't see for ages. You know, along this road, there's people very rarely see. Uh, and I lived here since since the eighties, so it's really trying to, to bring that together. And the the Halloween brings the kids in, and if you bring the kids together, it means that, that there's going to be hopefully less disputes going on because they all know each other. When we had our PCSOs, that uh, that really did you know bring everybody together because there was a focal point, and there was some sort of power there as well. And and when. We'll get on to the, uh, the Queen's Award in a second, but you made that point, I think, when, when that award was making about the importance of the PCSO. So we're now veering onto the polit political part of this interview, but you think there are, do you, do you mourn the loss of your PCSOs? Yes. I think it was a great loss. It was obviously to save money, but I think in the long run it doesn't. It doesn't save any money. At all. all it does is push whatever they would have paid the PCSOs to the other authorities. So whereas we could rely on our PCSO to sort our issues and problems out or help us in times of need, we've got no one to sort that out now. We have to go to the relevant authority to try and get that done. So whether it be Hansel Council because of the dumping of the rubbish, so they're now having to remove more and more rubbish. Whereas before we could have nipped that in the bud and got it done and the council don't have those resources. So now we may ring a policeman because there's a bike on the estate that's riding around uh, we know we're not going to get a response, and so in most cases people give up and don't bother anymore. Um, I mentioned the Queen's Award. Was that a complete surprise? Yes and no. I mean, we, someone did come down. I can't think who. Someone applied for it, and they came down and interviewed us. We didn't know whether he was going to get it, obviously, mm. uh, and so it was a, a surprise in the fact that we got it. But we knew we'd, we'd been put in for it, and that was last year. And there was a good turnout for that. The PCSO came down. He was living in Cornwall. He made that journey all the way down. And in fact, when he left, there was a massive turnout uh, on the day he uh, he left. And uh, there was a cake. Cakes were made, and things were given. Gifts were given. So it was a good um, 
a surprise, but we didn't get any money. That's what we really need money because we can't. It, uh, when we run events, they don't take a lot of money because I'm, I'm tight with money, but we do need some money. Uh, with the football that we run, we used to pay one of the local kids who done his examinations, who used to play football with us when he was younger and then moved into that role. And when you get someone who moves into that role and the kids know him, it sort of gives them, them some incentive that they can too can work their way up and become those type of people. But because that's, then we haven't got the funding now, it's gone. You, you lose that and the kids become a bit lost. You're still out filming though, aren't you? I, I think the last time I saw you was at Linkfest. You still enjoy doing things like that? I still do enjoy doing that, yeah. yeah. They are, um, it's part of, again, history, isn't it? It's a record of the events that go on. Um, and I've got, uh, if you go back to the 70s, uh, when we used to have the big festivals in the town park. Did we you go to any of those concerts? I did, and I've got some photos somewhere. Uh, who do you remember? Uh, we've gone way back now, probably I was going to conclude here, but we've gone back. Who uh, do you remember? Um, Caravan. Basic Rollers, Eddie and the Hot Rods, uh, and a few other, uh, a few other bands that were at the time, but I can't remember now. But and when that was every every Sunday, yeah. no Saturday night. Mm -hmm. Saturday night. Sundays was for the oldies. <laughs> that was Joe Loss and stuff like that. Uh, and that used to be an afternoon, mm. and that was, it was a great town. I don't remember any trouble. Mm. Uh, so as Harlow, in conclusion, you know, you, you please with, with the role you've played in 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 Harlow's history in that way. You may say you've just been doing jobs, but well, I'm, saying, I'm, got, I'm, I'm just doing what I what, what I enjoy. Yeah. The fact is, made me, or it, it you know integrates me into the history. It is, I suppose, a nice thought, but that's not the reason that it was done. It was just done to to make. To make other people's lives more enjoyable, so try and bring people together. Because if you live in a place like we do here, then it's only right that you look after the place where you live and make it nice and accessible. Just like when someone comes into your house, you like to have a nice house. They don't think you're some kind of slob who's rubbish all over the place. Zulkachina.